All right, I'll get us started. There's a little bit of background I want to cover before we get into this, what I think is a very exciting panel. Um, today's panel is more than just pipes, lessons from the field about safer smoking supplies. We have Lisa Al-Hakim from the People's Harm Reduction Alliance and Paula Kosky and Jacob Ball from the Dave Purchase Pro Project um, slash Tacoma Needle Exchange. And I'm Allison Newman at the University of Washington Addictions Drug and Alcohol Institute. So just so you know, we're on a Zoom webinar, which means that if you're just attending, we can't see or hear you and only the presenters can share their screen and audio. You can enter questions and comments into the chat and Q&A. There's no need to enter your name and organization into the chat. We have at least your email address and when you registered. And the webinar will be recorded and posted along with the slides at stopoverdose.org backslash section backslash webinars. So I just wanna begin by acknowledging that as we gather today, we are on the ancestral homelands of the indigenous peoples who have lived on these lands since time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors. So we have just a brief agenda today. Um, I'm gonna to present a, just a snippet of data from our Washington State Syringe Services Program survey. And then we'll have a panel discussion where we talk about safer smoking supplies, distribution 101, participants response and lessons learned. So um, some of this will be review for those of you who've seen me talk about this data before, maybe some of it's new. This is a little bit of background on why we're talking about safer smoking supplies today. So we do a survey every other year that was developed by us at ADAI along with Public Health Seattle and King County and the Washington Department of Health. It, we do it every other year and the last time it was conducted was in fall 2021. We've also did two rounds of qualitative interviews in 2018 and 2021. And if you wanna find the comprehensive survey work we've done over the last few years, it's available at this webpage. So why are we talking about smoking today? Well, one thing we learned from our most recent survey was that lots of people are uh, smoking drugs. So that for people, especially fentanyl, which was definitely a topic of concern. So over half of people we talked to in the survey who had used fentanyl in the past few months, about half of people had smoked it only. Um, a quarter had smoked and injected. So for trying to address fentanyl, we think that it's really important that safer, uh, we reach people who are smoking drugs. Um, for methamphetamine, interestingly, about half of people were smoking and injecting it. Um, we also asked how interested people were in smoking supplies. We asked, would you like to get free clean pipes or foil to smoke opioids, cocaine, or meth among people who had injected drugs in the last three months? And about three quarters of them were interested. Um, and of those, about two thirds said that they would inject less often if these supplies were available. The other reason that safer smoking supplies may be important is that um, at, at syringe services programs, people knew a large network of people who smoked but did not inject drugs. The median was six and the average was 11 and the range was zero to 75. So likely, there's a huge network of people out there who smoke drugs, but don't inject, who may be accessible through the provision of safer smoking supplies. If you wanna learn more about sort of distribution of safer smoking supplies as a public health strategy, we do have this info brief that was released that Paul gave information about. Um, and it's a good background on sort of the legal status of it, the public health, rationale for it and just provide some good background. So um, I'm gonna dive right into our panel. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can see everyone a little bit bigger. And I'll start just by having um, each of you introduce yourselves and talk about um, where your program is based. Should I call on someone first? We'll start with Lisa. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa al -Hakim. Um, I use she, her, they, them pronouns, and I am the Director of Operations at the People's Harm Reduction Alliance. Um, we are a program that was started in 2007. We're based in Seattle, but we have sites in Kitsap County, Snohomish County, um, also Portland. So 
or kind of like a collective of different uh, drug user health programs, basically. Jacob and Paul, where um, tell us a little bit about your program and where you're based. Um, so I'm Paul Lukoski. I'm the executive director of Dave Purchase Project. Um, we run the Tacoma Needle Exchange, which was started in 1988 by Dave Purchase. Um, we serve Tacoma and all of Pierce County. Uh, we have our first brick and mortar site at 3716 South Pacific Avenue, Suite F. It's been open for about a year now. It's awesome not having to operate out of vans on cold, rainy days, although we still do that even on cold, rainy days. Um, yeah, and I just, I really have the distinct honor of being uh, at the head of a, a great group of people and a great organization. Uh, and I'm Jacob and I work on the outreach team there. I've been doing uh, our safer smoking supply distribution for over a year now and uh, do in camp and outreach program that program there as well. So could you um, maybe describe the basics of your safer smoking supplies program? Like what supplies do you hand out? What does that look like? Be on us still? Who, whoever. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we uh, carry bubbles or meth pipes was what we started with. Um, and still holds the, the main popularity there. Um, and then we also carry hammer pipes, which we initially started uh, carrying for people to smoke heroin out of um, and have uh, are commonly referred to now. Apologies. Uh, are commonly referred to now uh, by our participants as pill pipes. So people are smoking a lot of the fentanyl blues out of them. Uh, and then we have uh, straight pipes as well. And then we also carry uh, foil that uh, is like kind of sands the chemicals that you get in the store. Do you have any of those nearby you could hold up to show? Yeah, I can get all of those. Uh, I should probably have had them ready. If you want to have someone else talk, I can grab them real quick. Sure. Paul or Lisa? Or Paul, do you want to add anything to talk about your program before I hand it off to Lisa? The, the only thing I want to say is that we, so the, the decision to kind of, or the impetus to start um, distributing safer smoking supplies really came from the outreach team and the requests that people were getting when they were out doing outreach at the sites. And we started a while ago. Um, you know, several years ago, when we, whenever we had foil, we would, we would distribute foil, um, but foil was kind of a hard to come by commodity. Um, and then in the last year or so, uh, or the last three years, people were saying, we really need to start doing something to address the, the stimulant users. Um, and, and specifically the stimulant users that weren't injecting. Um, and so we did a little bit of research. Um, we, we, you know, kind of had to convince our board that this was an okay thing to do. We got their kind of stamp of approval. Um, to do a limited distribution of safer smoking supplies as long as we collected data to make sure that we had uh, something that we could then convince other folks with. Um, and so it was really, the, the impetus was really participants asking for things and staff taking the time to listen and recognizing that they needed these things. And it, it, it was a natural progression from injection um, to safer smoking is moving away from sticking a needle in your arm, um, which is, you know, really causes some of the most harm when you're injecting drugs is just the, the constant reuse of a needle or sticking a needle in your arm. So it's a natural progression. Um, and we're not the first people to hand out safer smoking supplies. Um, you know, people have been doing it for a long time with very little attention paid. It just seems in the last few years because of the huge kind of rapid and dramatic shift in drug use patterns due to a lot of things, um, it really, the, the impetus to do this and the necessity to do this is really dramatically increased. Um, so this is our foil that we get, which is one use foil, uh, comes in like 24 sheets per case. And then it's got like a little, uh, how to roll your own pipe thing on the back of it. 
and we get those out of Ireland's and we have just your regular uh, straight pipe for uh, smoking, mostly for smoking crack cocaine. Um, and we give that with a piece of Brillo or Cherboy. Uh, and then it's your average meth pipe, if you've never seen one, also known as a bubble. And then uh, last but not least, uh, I believe uh, somebody up in Seattle started getting these made for them. Uh, and we got the connect there. Uh, and this is our hammer pipe. It's uh, open on one end, closed on the other. Uh, and we give that with like a couple brass screens that go for it. And that's for uh, people smoke heroin or the fentanyl pills or also powder fentanyl out of that. So Lisa, I'd love to hear what you at People's Harm Reduction Alliance, um, sort of what you're handing out and how it came about. Yeah, so we are handing out all of that. That's the same things, but we actually have done them at different times. We actually started handing out our straight pipes, our crack pipes first, and that was in 2010. So it's been over a decade of us handing out that specific pipe. Um, and obviously the reason we started handing it out is because our participants asked for it. That's like what we build our programming around. We do surveys, we do elections, that sort of thing. So we're just always constantly like, what do you need? What do you want? What would make things better? So that's how that came about. Um, we started handing out the bubble in 2015. So it's been a while for that one. Um, and that was just, we started with the crack pipe because at the time that's what people were smoking a lot of around the exchange. Obviously that's changed quite a bit now. Um, and then we moved into bubbles because stimulant users were like, we we also want this, you know, we need the straight pipe, we need the bubble pipe. So we launched that in 2015. Um, and then the hammer was in 2019. And actually the design for that came out of Pry. Um, and it's really similar to an opium pipe. If you, that's like the kind of basis off that because it makes total sense. It's the same kind of drug, like make, like, what am I? It's sticky, <laughs> basically is what I'm trying to say. So you've got black tar heroin here, which is a sticky, kind of like opium so it's like we were thinking oh that might be the same kind of effect that we want you know you could i don't know just the design makes sense and then we did a bunch of different kinds of designs and like gave them out to different participants and kind of got feedback like what worked best how did you do it that sort of thing and obviously like we're peer ran so like there's a bunch of people here who use drugs so we just like had a whole I don't know, I guess it was about a year of just like experimenting with different kinds of pipes and finally landed on that design being the best one and the one that works. And you can do like, we have a, a little instructions that come with it. Um, and so you can do like a slow kind of burn or you can do kind of like a, oh my, you can do like a, I can't remember what the word is for it. But, uh, you know, when you smoke weed and you get, Get really hot and then like, a, like a dab thank you a dab that's it um so those were the those are the two ways people are using them but yes now people are definitely smoking pills out of them and also sometimes using the meth pipe for that too um so that was something obviously we didn't see coming because i did i don't think any of us were like oh we're going to give out way less syringes because everybody's going to start smoking pills <laughs> so that was definitely something we did not expect to see and we pretty much have the same things in our kits. Like our crack kit has, you know, a crack condom, what we call it, it's like a little piece of plastic. I don't have it with me, but it's about this long and you just fit it right over the pipe because the crack pipe gets really hot. And so you could burn your lips and then you could, you know, possibly like transfer hep C or other things. And also now because of COVID. Um, so it's just a way for you to smoke and share a pipe, but you just take, your mouthpiece off when you're passing and the next person can have a mouthpiece and put that on. So we have that and it fits over our other pipes as well. Um, and then it has a condoms in it and a paper clip and Brillo uh, and then like a little tap of chopstick to push your Brillo down. And the hammer pipes are pretty similar. It's got a couple of screens and, you know, instructions and then just like another paper clip because it's the paper clip is to kind of fish the screens and stuff out uh, when you need to replace them. 
Um, and then our bubble is just a bubble by itself. We don't have anything with that. Possibly could change in the future. We've been talking about maybe putting a kit together for that, but yeah. And we also do foil. That was actually 2021, we started doing smoking foil. Um, we started with regular foil and then we switched over to smoking foil, which um, as you were saying, like uh, it's just doesn't have the chemicals that are more damaging to you like a regular foil would have. So. Oh, really excellent. And we've had some questions come in already that I think some are really super relevant to this and some I might put off for a little farther. But I have one question, like, do you have info on how to get the foil? Sounds like food grade aluminum foil is harmful. Yeah, so Nason actually sells the foil. We purchased the foil from a harm reduction manufacturer in Ireland um, called One Use. Um, and they ship to us and then we distribute from Nason. So you can get the foil through Nason. Um, I don't know, there may be other organizations that sell it, but I, I'm not sure. Um, it, it is in short supply worldwide, I will tell you that. Um, we just purchased a huge quantity that, well, we just were supposed to receive a huge quantity that we purchased about six months ago. Um, we're also supposed to be getting some more, um, one use did actually open a warehouse in the United States because they were shipping so much product to us through, um, the United States. So you can get it there. Um, it is, it's free of the chemical contaminants and things like that, that other foil would have, um, which is why it's preferred. Um, but like I said, it is, it's, it is subject to everything else these days, which is supply chain issues and manufacturer slowdowns. And then since it has to get shipped from Europe, um, it's also shipping delays have, have delayed things. Um, the, the mouthpiece that Lisa was talking about, I wanna make sure everyone knows, it's, it's really, it's just a spark plug cover. Um, and so you can get them at any auto parts store if you really wanted one. Um, we sell them through Nason as well. Um, they taste horrible but I'm sure they taste better than scalding your lips and, you know, getting a huge burn or, you know, COVID or a germ. The other thing people use is you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's and get um, tubing that you can just snip yourself and use that as well. Um, I'm going to ask a few more questions that are focused really just on like the nuts and bolts pieces. Like I had a question, screens and Brillo are functionally equivalent question mark. I think that was um, we use the tubing also, so different. Yeah, definitely the tubing tastes a little bit less gross, <laughs> but, but they both work great. So that's the tubing. Um, yeah, the tubing. Uh, yeah, there's like the clear tubing and then the spark plug cover. Um, for the, so <laughs> this is a funny story. We were thinking about trying to switch over from Brillo to a different screen type thing. Like some of our participants were like, this works good, you know, and so they were like, oh, we'll try it out. And also it's kind of a lot of labor, like sitting in the link Brillo and cutting it and rolling, you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of volunteers to do that. Uh, so we did try, start to experiment with using the screens we hand down the hammer pipe in the crack pipe by like sort of pushing them down and like together and then also separately in different ways um, and tried handing some out and people did not like it at all. So yeah. <laughs> we didn't do that. We went just back to just all Brillo. But for a while we had like the crack pipe had two different, you could have get Brillo or you could get both. But yeah, people did not seem to like it at all. So I would say, depending on what you're smoking, you want to use the right screen and vice versa with the hammer pipe, like the Brillo wouldn't really work with that at all. So yeah, I think they're yeah. just specific to their own pipe. Yeah. And so I just want to say, so we have screens, Brillo and Chorboy. Um, and they all, I mean, functionally, yes, they just keep you from sucking whatever you're burning into your lungs. But the, the Brillo has, I mean, it can have a tendency to break up and sometimes it comes impregnated with, like if you buy Brillo at Lowe's, it comes impregnated with a cleanser or something. So you wanna make sure you're getting Brillo that is free of any kind of cleansing agent or things like that. And you wanna make sure that it's, it's not broken up because you don't wanna suck Brillo into your lungs. Um, but I would say, you know, a screen, or chore boy is going to be, it's the likelihood of that getting sucked in is less likely. But as Lisa said, it really depends on what you're used to or what you're smoking and what your preference is. And I have another question sort of about the supplies. Um, 
Can the bubble pipes be used for heroin and crack as well if no straight or hammer pipes are available? Uh, <laughs> I mean, any, anything with a glass tube part on it can, can be used to smoke crack out of like people, you know, but you're, in order to do that, your people are generally gonna break off the end of it. Um, and then uh, starting right there, you know, you're kind of leading away from the, the safer smoking part. You know, if you have people passing around broken glass utensils to, to put their mouths on or, you know, uh, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I think Lisa already said people will smoke like uh, heroin or fentanyl out of out of the bubbles like um you can it's just not not as desirable i suppose doesn't work as well and another supplies question mm -hmm. that i think could segue us into some other things is i'm curious if you guys collect back any materials we are struggling with items being left behind while still trying to maintain our good neighbor policies mostly foils I mean, we will take back anything people bring back. I mean, but mostly people bring back syringes because they can do the exchange. I mean, the pipes are, they're just glass. And so people break them up and, you know, into the street anyway. Foil is something that, you know, we, you know, we will take it back if people bring it back, but they don't often bring it back. Um, and there's not been that much of it available, I think, so that it's really a hazard at this point. Um, we would definitely encourage people always to safely dispose of whatever they're using. Um, if it's syringes, bring them back. Um, if it's pipes or foil that are broken, discard them properly and, and don't leave them. Um, but honestly, you know, at the site that we pass out most of our safer smoking supplies, and Jacob can attest to this, the people that live at this site, which has become a de facto encampment over the last two years, they patrol their own area and make sure it's clean. I mean, we show up and they're sweeping the sidewalk and things like that. They, they know what people think and they don't want to contribute to that image. And you know, it's it's where they live. They want to keep it as clean as possible. It's not always as clean as everyone would like it to be, but it's as clean as they can keep it. And and we do occasionally, uh, because we'll sit out there, we're out there for so for five hours every Wednesday, and we have our biohazard containers sitting out. People will come by and chuck old pipes in there, broken pipes in there. Um, yeah, we definitely have people who will just like yeah, chuck their broken pipes, their foil in the sharp skin container. And also, you know, like it's well known that, you know, if you have a syringe exchange program, then there's going to be less needle litter, obviously around that needle exchange program. And I think that goes for foil and for pipes and all that sort of thing. Um, I also don't know what kind of a hazard foil would really be. I mean, yes, drugs were smoked out of it, but they're gone now and you cannot overdose from touching fentanyl. So I don't really, I don't think that would be a hazard per se. I'm sure somebody would find a reason to say it would be a hazard, but I, I think, you know, again, like smoking off foil, you know, once you're done, crumple it up and that's it. You know, it's a ball of foil. So it's actually less, I guess, you know, visible and less potentially hazardous than like, you know, a new syringe, you know, uh, so yeah. So I have a um, next area of question. There's been so many good questions. I'm just gonna go off of these instead of the ones that I pre-wrote just in case people weren't engaged. Um, what are some of the, your risk reduction messages that you provide to folks who may be sharing pipes? Do you encounter folks that are hot railing? Yeah, people use the straight pipe for hot railing for sure. Um, and someone else did ask what is hot railing? So it would be good to define that too. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. So hot railing is like basically kind of like vaporizing a stimulant and then like, it's like snorting, but vaporizing, like making it a bit hot. Yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like smoking through your nose, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Describe it as that. You'll essentially like you would you would lay out like a line of um, like methamphetamine generally, um, 
and then you would just take like a torch and you would heat up the one end of this that you're not going to stick in your nose really hot uh and then you just put the other end in your nose and you go and um basically do the rail and when it comes up onto the glass it instantly turns into smoke so it's like yeah basically like snorting a huge a huge hit of of drugs but in smoke smoke form like really fast mm -hmm. So I guess for the associated part of the questions, what kind of risk reduction messages do you share with people who might be sharing smoking supplies or just in general with the smoking supplies? How do you communicate to people about them? Um, I mean, one of the one of the great things uh, about when we started giving them out was, well, I don't know if that's a great thing. That's kind of a weird way to say that. but. When we started giving them out, it was uh, right after uh, we were able to open our sites back up after the COVID shutdown. Um, so, you know, one of the really good things there was in that period of time, because it was pre-vaccines existing at all, even that era, um, was that people weren't passing something around, you know, uh, that everybody's putting their mouths on. Uh, and then um, we, you can do the different mouthpieces so that people can take them on, put them off or whatever uh, as you pass them around. Or we also give out, um, we have like sanitizing supplies, you know, and let people know to definitely be sanitizing your pipe, especially for sharing with people that aren't in your circle already uh, or whatever. Um, yeah, we definitely like alcohol pads is another thing. We're just like take an alcohol pad and like wipe it off if you don't have you know one of the little pieces of plastic to put over it. I've seen people like smoke with like the pipe in their hand, but not their mouth on the pipe, so they smoke through their hand. So that's something people can do. And obviously, like one of our messages is like don't share for pipes. You know, mostly it was a crack pipe in the beginning because it gets so hot. But, you know, with COVID, it was definitely like, don't share your pipes. Like, and if you're going to share pipes, make sure that you are either wiping it off with an alcohol pad or you're, you know, using one of those plastic mouthpieces. So, yeah, I think much the same communication to people about that. And then, um, I mean, with smoking as well and with fentanyl becoming more and more prevalent, you know, as every day passes. Uh, we also try to like stay engaged with people and like make sure that people understand that smoking fentanyl is not a safe way. <laughs> like there's no real safe way to like induce fentanyl on the street and like just smoking it is not gonna protect you from overdose. So like we're, you know, forever making sure people know that like you can still overdose when you're smoking fentanyl, you can still overdose on fentanyl, even if it's just the cut in your methamphetamines. Like, do you have Narcan? Make sure you're carrying Narcan. Do you know how to use Narcan? Um, I don't know. I think one of, one of the messages that, and, and Jacob just hit upon that, is that we are really reinforcing the message that smoking fentanyl is not a overdose prevention method. Um, Thank you. And that you really, that um, people should carry um, naloxone, even if they're just doing stimulant, because um, there are people who are overdosing um, and, they're, and they're, you know, they're saying, but I was just smoking. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't using opioids. Um, so there's this message that you need to carry naloxone, even if, you, even if you're not a regular user of opioids, you should carry it. Um, you should use fentanyl test strips when you can, um, and that uh, that smoking fentanyl does not obviate the possibility of an overdose or an opioid poisoning. Um, all of those things, and then you know we did get back to the the COVID message. You know when we first started passing out, you know it's best not to share your your equipment. Um, um, I think one of the unanticipated, and this is not directly harm reduction for drug use, but one of the unanticipated kind of harm reduction methods we have seen is that. People say that when they have their own smoking equipment, that they have much more autonomy over their own drug use, as well as potentially their own bodily autonomy, because 
if you're relying on someone else and you're in a, a, a relationship that has a, a disparate um, control um, or you're in an abusive relationship and that person controls your smoking equipment, um, you have to do what they say. Um, and if you don't, that can cause a lot of, that can cause harm now. And so having your own equipment allows you to bodily autonomy as well as uh, drug use autonomy and control your own behavior more, which is something that I, it makes sense now that I've read of, you know, a couple of participants have talked about it, but it wasn't, it wasn't the intention when we started passing these things out. It was just a, a great side effect, I think. Yeah, it was, um, so I was, I was down doing uh, more of those interviews earlier today. And one of the really common things that people were talking about today was, you know, um, previous to us starting to pass out pipes there, uh, there were plenty of people who uh, the way that they would get they would supply their drug use is they would make sure to have a pipe all the time and they would just kind of go around and they would look for people that needed to use a pipe and they'd get people to load their drugs up into their pipe and then they'd just dip out and so uh, you know you hear a lot of people saying yeah like when i don't have my own supplies to use my drugs like i spend my whole day sick getting my money to take care of myself and then as soon as I get my stuff, then I, you know, need someone to use somebody's stuff and then I get my stuff stolen. And so like, I think that like, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that like uh, <clears throat> an interesting thing with fentanyl smoking is I think in the beginning we were like, oh my God, like, okay, how are we gonna, you know, approach this? Cause I think that the drug supply changed pretty quickly within like a six month span and just like kind of, and that, and it was a totally different game. Um, <clears throat> but what we started hearing from our participants is they were like, I stopped injecting. I started smoking, like I'm smoking. And we were like, cool, but also this can still be dangerous. So the same message, but also recognizing that people were feeling more in control. If that makes it like, they were like, I'm not injecting. And that is a big deal when mm -hmm. people like don't want to inject and then they somehow find a way not to. So not like ignoring that part and being like, that's awesome that you did that. But let's talk about, you know, the risks with fentanyl, but also knowing that, you know, like there is a safe way to use fentanyl. It's just that we don't know how much fentanyl is in the pills or whatever we're using. Right. So right. like, and that's the challenge. Cause you know, if we, again, like, I'm not going to go off on my giant safe supply thing, but if we did have safe supply, then there would be a safe way to use fentanyl and all of other drugs, obviously. But, but definitely, I think it's a really complex thing that's going on right now. You know, it's like people are excited that they're not injecting, but also, you know, there's risk here because we don't know how much fentanyl is in the drug. So I think that us in harm reduction is are like trying to come up with these new ideas right now, and it's like playing catch up, but also listening to our folks be so excited about like not injecting i don't know i just think that's such an important thing to recognize and to definitely you know encourage people to be proud of themselves for doing that because it's cool when you you know do some harm reduction for yourself so so yeah i i think with mass spectrometers like that's great too but you know there's a whole other realm of stuff with that that <laughs> i don't think it's going to super help with fentanyl and pills either but you know uh, we'll come up with something we always do, but, <laughs> but yeah, I just, I just wanted to put that in there about people smoking fentanyl. So I think it's important to recognize that. Yeah. I think that's a really great point is that, uh, despite a lot of the risks with fentanyl, the fact that people are then, you know, saving their veins, reducing their risk for HIV and hep C is also really important. Um, I want to yeah. pivot to make sure we touch on a few other things that I think are probably, <clears throat> um, pretty interesting to the group which is, um, I have a question in the q and I have two questions. One about funding. How did you get funding for how expensive safer smoking supplies are? And do you have any advice about legalities? So I guess I can, it's still illegal to distribute pipes. Well, it's, it's, a, it's not a criminal, it's a civil infraction now. In Washington. In Washington, Blake changed that. So it's, but every time we hand out a pipe, we risk a civil infraction. 
Um, I've told my staff that if the police ever show up, the first thing they do is call me. Um, I will come down to the site. Um, that's one of the reasons we're actually very controlled about where we distribute pipes uh, until we get more kind of legal cover. Um, uh, is is it only one place we don't deliver them we want someone asked me the other day to mail them some supplies and I was like no we can't do that um, if you come down to the site we will we will you know give them to you um, so it's it's still a legal gray area and Blake changed that so it's, like I said it's not criminal it's civil and we could still do that the ironic thing is you know you can sell these things up the street from us and say they're for incense and it's perfectly legal we can't give them to someone knowing what the, that they're gonna use them for math without, without a civil infraction. The other thing is funding. We pay for these out of money that, out of revenue that we generate. In no way do we use any taxpayer or grant funds to pay for these things. We're very clear and I'm very clear when I talk to my staff about how these are funded. These are from donations from individuals, from revenue that we raise because you cannot do that yet. Um, and that leads to another question, which is, you know, and I think Lisa alluded to this and others, is that we've seen a reduction in the number of syringes going out, but we can't then say, well, you know, we've, you know, we've seen a 300,000 deduction in the number of syringes we gave out three years ago versus last year. Um, but we can't say, well, you know, since we're not using that money on syringes, can we just use it for safer smoking supplies? That's not allowed. So we've seen the reduction in syringes, but we still have to raise our own money for safer smoking supplies. Um, and if we really want to reach everyone, all drug users, we have to start giving out the things that people need, even those who are not injecting. And the number of people who've come to the exchange and said, well, I never came here before because I thought you only gave out needles, you didn't have anything for me, is pretty astonishing. Um, and, you know, that we have to engage those folks. And if they just, if they just think of the exchange, and we may even need to rethink what we call ourselves as the syringe exchange, then they're going to think, well, there's nothing there for me. Um, so, but the funding is really tricky. We have to raise it. This stuff is not cheap. And, you know, we could easily triple or quadruple our distribution, um, but we, we, we don't have the funding for it. It's phenomenally expensive to give this stuff up. Although I would dare say it's a lot less expensive than paying for someone's HIV treatment or hepatitis treatment. Um, you know, it's much less expensive to keep people from getting one of these conditions that safer smoking supplies will help with than having to treat them after the fact. And I would say for anyone, you know, who um, who inadvertently received uh, injected themselves with HIV, and got, nothing is nothing is too expensive to keep them from getting that kind of condition. Um, and so we just have to think about how we are prioritizing our spending um, for this. But it's expensive, and we have to raise that money ourselves. And not we're fortunate that we can do that. Not every exchange can. And um, I think we need to see more support from the government. It was great to see that safer smoking supplies were included in the SAMHSA grant and then it was immediately yeah. retracted. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty, it was really disheartening the walk back on that. I was so excited when I first saw that. I was like, finally, they get it. And then suddenly it was like, well, no. You know, yeah, um, definitely. It, it, it you know, you got to raise the money and you got to make do somehow. And syringe exchanges are really good at getting stuff done. We've been doing it for 30 plus years um, and we'll do it. Yeah. I mean, I think with our, our funding, like same thing, like we, it was just like private donations, like, you know, that sort of thing and scrounging basically since 2010 to do pipes, like just scrounging all the time, trying to get the pipe money together. Um, you know, and we, we get our pipes straight from like the source, like we order from a place in Canada that makes the pipe. So, you know, like the more we order, you know, the cheaper it gets and that sort of thing. So we're always trying to balance that. How much money can we sink into the pipes to get them to be cheaper, but also this, you know, and so it turns into that sort of thing. But I do think on pipe legality, I mean, it is a gray area. Like everything in harm reduction is like a gray area. It just is. And, you know, again, we've been handing these out since 2010, and we've never, ever got a civil infraction. We've never had a problem, literally, not even one time. Now, there's definitely been people who have been, like, you know, upset, uh, asking questions, but there's never been any legality issues. And also, you know, when you're doing something that's 
strictly for research, that's protected. But when you're doing something that's not for research, it's not protected, ironically, which is really a problem. <laughs> it's really problematic. But I think when you're doing both, you know, because like obviously when we're doing pipes, we're doing research and we're doing something that our people want. We're going to do both because you have to, you know, eventually if you want to get money, you have to have like a, re you know, like here's what we collected and here's how this, you know, and here's what we saw and that sort of thing. Um, but again, like, yeah, the funding is still, the funding is still just like private funders and like, you know, like there's been a small grant here and there that's more like national because people have been doing pipes, you know, in other countries for a long time. So, but yeah, again, it is just, it is a expensive thing, but like Paul said, like it's completely worth it. Obviously when we're talking about harm reduction and reducing harm in any way, smoking is a big it's a big deal you know it's a big deal and i think we saw people we didn't expect actually to see people going from injecting to smoking but that did happen and mm -hmm. then we were surprised about that so uh yeah you've touched on it a little bit already but i just talked about some of the the hurdles which is like the funding and the legality but what has the participant response been like i mean some pra has been doing it for a long time you know, Tacoma Needle Exchange more recently. So what do what do participants think about it? I mean, ours or our participants were excited because they're the ones who had the idea. <laughs> so it was like, oh, you're going to do the thing we want. You know, we always do, but, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Um, but obviously it was overwhelmingly good. You know, people were excited. And also we gained like double our participants for people who just smoke like half of the people who come in and maybe even more than half now are just for smoking materials. Um, and so it's just, yeah, it's just like been interesting to watch people just be, just be like, I can't believe you're doing this. You know, <laughs> this is basically what, what the reaction is. And then they're really excited. And I also like think that it communicates to our folks that we care about them and we care about what they think and what they need and what they want. And, you know, again, like as a peer run program, like we, we're all like people who either currently use drugs or have used drugs, you know, in our lives. And like, we know what works and what doesn't. And so it was no surprise to us that that's what people wanted. And then, you know, we just made it happen. So I think they're still really excited and people still can't believe that we're doing it all the time. <laughs> so. Yeah, overwhelmingly people are just absolutely excited about it occasionally we'll get like new people uh and occasionally have like the confused reaction you know and they'll like have already gotten it and they're like so why are you doing this and then um and that's actually kind of great because uh it then leads into just like a basic general conversation about harm reduction which on a couple occasions um you know i've talked about that with someone and said yeah so like that's what we're down here trying to do and then that person who was just there for their pipe and ready to bounce is like oh well I have this wound and I don't want to go to the doctor or something like this would keep me safe and it's like oh yeah we have those things too and like kind of so it gets people down there and uh, like Lisa said like a much larger number of people and connects them with other harm reduction services as well and kind of just gets that general idea around to more folks um but overwhelmingly just happy good for us as well yeah i i read some data real quick before i came here of the close to 4000 encounters we had at g street in the first 13 months of distribution about 45% of those no syringes smoking supplies yep about half yeah same. and it's it's my, my my only fear with that is that people look at syringes out and they're you know funders are going to say well the number of syringes going out is going down so we can reduce your funding but it's it's not that the number of syringes is going down because we're finally we're getting people to switch over to smoking which is more expensive we need more money and we need smoking supplies we don't need less in the overall pie we just need to shift the way mm -hmm. things are working yeah, exactly. Definitely there are, it would be nice to buy some pipes with some syringe money. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm looking at how much time we have left and I'm realizing we won't be able to answer everyone's questions, but I can compile them and send them to our panelists to get answers that we can send out later. So if we don't get to your question, we will try and find a way to get you answers. Some of these questions are sort of complex. Um, there's a few that I wanna make sure we answer that are very like practical, which is um, one is, are there any health issues associated with smoking through glass or really just smoking drugs? I mean, there's always gonna be health issues <laughs> with, you know, doing anything in life. I mean, you know, it's called harm reduction. You know, we're reducing harm. Um, you know, we're not here to be like the treatment people. We're not here, you know, that's not our, our thing. Our thing is harm reduction. And it is a reduction in harm when you go from injecting to smoking. Of course, there could be health risks and there could not be health risks. You know, I think it just depends on the individual, but, um, you know, it's hard to just make that blanket statement. Like every person who uses drugs is completely different from each other. So everyone reacts differently. Yeah. And I would say on a, on a, on a, on a kind of purely scientific point, I'm, you know, there's going to have to be more research on what it's like in this. Um, I think that it just a gut reaction would be that the harm would very likely come from the adulterants in the drugs as opposed to the actual drugs themselves. Again, a kind of plea for a clean and safe drug supply. Um, you know, the, 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 the things that are mixed with the pills as you're vaporizing those pills and sucking them in, that's probably going to be more damaging. But We'll have to see. I mean, frankly, if we had a few years worth of good data behind us in some clinical studies, we could see what what the difference is um, between the health of someone who smokes drugs versus an individual that, that say injects or does them another way. And like the way that they're asking through glass. So if that question is meant to be asking like as from glass opposed to smoking through other things, I think glass right. is generally the safest way. Yeah. Um, as long as it's you know, clean. And I have one pretty straightforward question, which I think is just good to get out there. How many times can you use smoking supplies until you have to replace? Do you give out one pipe per person slash session, et cetera? I mean, you can and use the pipe till it breaks, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. If you're careful with your pipe, you can use yeah. it until it breaks. Yeah. And we give out one per person of each pipe because strictly funding. Like we yeah. don't have the, I mean, we like, like y'all were saying, like we could easily 10 times the amount we're having out now. Uh, but yeah, we do have to keep it to one per person of each pipe just because we just can't financially do any more than that. Yeah. And we do one per person per week at the site. And I have another easy question, which is if you're willing to share your contact information, each of you, and if you are, please put it in the chat. And if not, people oh, yeah. can email me and I can forward questions. Um, just wanted to make sure that you saw that. A lot of these questions were more about fentanyl, but I wanna make sure that we get through a lot of the focus on the safer smoking pieces before we sort of shift to that. Cause fentanyl is definitely a big piece of this, but um, you know, I think you touched on this a little bit, but I'm very interested to hear, are you seeing different participants as well because you're handing out safer smoking supplies? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. About I'm, like double the participants that are new. Well, not new now, but when we started handing out the pipes that, that were new, totally new. Just heard we were doing it and came down, and they've been coming for years now. So yeah. And we see people in different circles that we wouldn't normally see, and that's. I mean, if for nothing else, just alone the amount of extra people that we have carrying Narcan and trained with Narcan and people who would literally have never come to us or gotten naloxone, you know, um, coming back and being like, yeah, I saved this random guy or, you know, whatever. So, yeah, seeing a larger number and bigger variety of people in different circles. Yeah, and I think that, so four years ago when we started giving out fentanyl test strips in Tacoma, we had opioid users trying to avoid fentanyl. Last week at the exchange, it's, it's people who are deliberately seeking out fentanyl who are smoking it and not injecting it. So there's been a, a pretty dramatic shift. And before we weren't getting those folks. 
it, there's been a, like Lisa said, the, the shift in the drug use patterns has been nothing like I've ever seen in 30 years of doing uh, HIV prevention work and harm reduction work. Just the, the rapidity of the shift of, of supply and use and co how COVID impacted that, it was pretty astonishing. And I think we'll be, we'll be studying this for years. Yeah, I definitely like spun my head around. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, the question uh, right yeah. now you're seeing is people saying, will heroin ever come back? Will, will people ever be even looking for heroin anymore? I know some people are definitely looking for heroin, but they can't yeah. find it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is another issue. <laughs> but, uh, um, I have to loop back to funding a little bit. Um, Allison Barry, who I believe is with Clallam County, is that right? Mm -hmm. Said, you talked a bit about not being able to use grant funds for this. Can you say more about that? We're looking at adding this to a LHJ local health jurisdiction harm reduction program and are actively investigating funding mechanisms as we can't accept donations. And so, if that, you feel yeah. like that's outside what you can answer too, that's okay. <laughs> so, so I think you can't use government funds, taxpayer mm -hmm. dollars. So like we get an in-kind contribution from DOH, we can't say, okay, instead of giving us syringes, could you just give us pipes? And if we got a contract from the CDC um, or uh, some other entity, we couldn't use that funding to purchase pipes. Now there are some private foundations uh, <laughs> that will allow things like that. And you just, there, I mean, a, 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 a private foundation that's funded syringe exchange for years is the Comer Family Foundation. I don't know if they will allow you to purchase pipes, but that because they're a private family foundation, um, they are not restricted in what th they can decide whether or not that's a valid thing. Um, I think some funding from AIDS United possibly, but I know they get a lot of government pass-through dollars. So if it's federal pass-through dollars, um, or state tax dollars, very likely you are prohibited from using those. If it's private donations, say Paul Lukoski gives $1,000 to the Tacoma Needle Exchange, then they can spend that on whatever the hell they want. Um, and we do do that. Um, and I know a lot of executive directors and a lot of people at syringe exchanges donate their own money so that we can, so that pipes can be purchased because most dollars are restricted, um, highly restricted. Um, and when it comes to safer smoking supplies, you know, you just have to, you have a fundraiser and hope you make some money. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you hit up people with deep pockets, um, you know, who are maybe sympathetic to that, but the big dollars, the government dollars um, are not allowed. So, you know, we've been doing, yeah. you know, we have to pay for our own, you know, we scrounge for syringes and now we scrounge for safer smoking supplies. It's the same old story, just a different thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Uh, Comer is definitely supportive of funding uh, pipes. So that's what I'll say. I will talk to them <laughs> for sure. Uh, and AIDS United, uh, I believe is also supportive as well. Um, I think that, and also, yeah, private foundations, that's like where you're gonna get the pipe money right now and, and really just scrounging and fundraising. But for, you know, yeah, I mean, the government, <laughs> The government money needs to be opened up to pipes. It's completely ridiculous that we're not doing this already. Um, there's lots of there's lots of evidence. There's lots of studies in other country. It you know it's not like some brand new thing. You know, so I think it's just the same old story. Like Paul said, playing catch up. It's like okay, we could, man, you know when you couldn't buy syringes with government money. You could buy poker, like all the other stuff, but you couldn't buy the syringe itself. You know, and it's like we just caught up to that not that long ago. So I, I'm hoping pipes move a little bit uh, faster because, you know, the drug supply is changing and we need to change with it. And to not have the ability to buy pipes with the money for harm reduction is really asinine, honestly. So, um, but I am happy to talk about the funding methods more, um, obviously, with anyone who wants to email me. So we have five minutes left and I just want to wrap up with, um, Really, like, what do you think is the most important advice you can give if a program is looking to expand into safer smoking supplies? Um, just do it, <laughs> find a way, <laughs> find a way to do it. Um, and I would say that we did do like surveys and studies on our hammer pipe, but we didn't, um, when we released our straight pipe and our bubble pipe, it was so early on and there weren't a lot of people doing it in the States. Um, and I think that we all wish that we would have done that. 
So I do think like keeping in mind, like, you know, you don't have to like do super heavy research, but I mean, at least taking a survey and like, get, you know, just getting some numbers and ideas about like, if people's drug use is changing and that sort of thing is, is great. And specifically to, you know, your area and the people you're serving, um, I think that's super worthwhile. So I would say, just do it, but do that. And, you know, if you go out and try to find uh, your people with deep pockets too, like maybe <laughs> like, uh, you know, something to, you want it to be sustainable. You don't want to like launch a program and then have to like stop because yeah. you never want to do that. So just try to make sure that you have a way to make it sustainable is a big one. Yeah, I would say know your population and what drugs they're using and how they're using them so that you purchase the right supplies. Um, I would say make sure that you listen to what folks are telling you, your participants are telling you about how they're using. Um, and I would say, honestly, I would say, you know, be prepared to not be able to meet the demand because mm -hmm. there's going to be way more demand than you can possibly. Um, so you're going to have to make, you're going to have to draw those hard lines. Say, listen, we can only give you one pipe a week and it really sucks. But that's, that's just what we have to do. Um, and there's going to be some disappointment, but I think for the most part, folks will be super appreciative of what you're doing. I mean, the fact that you are providing folks with something that they, that they want and that they need, um, and the, the, the population we serve is so used to just getting nothing, uh, I think that they really appreciate the fact that people are listening to them and giving them what they need. But you got to be firm and you got to plan that you're not going to be able to meet all the need. Um, yeah. Yeah, that is the hard part, having to say, no, I don't have enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not fun, but it's, it's, it's the reality till we get some good funding behind us. Hopefully this will help. <laughs> yeah, and be prepared for a little bit of pushback. It might not come, but be prepared. Mm -hmm. Jacob, what are your closing words of advice? Um, I mean, I think what was said is great advice as long as you can keep it consistent. Um, and if you draw those hard lines, like, yeah, you're going to have some people upset at first, but after like, as long as you're keeping it so, uh, consistent, like Lisa said, um, after a very short period of time, when you let people know, hey, this is our funding issue. This is all we can do. If you want us to keep coming every week, this is what we do. The community is going to start taking care of most of that for you, and you're going to get nothing but but positive uh, results out of that. And people are just going to be really happy that you're there, you know, once a week for them to get that. So. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to the three of you for the work that you do and for making time to talk about all of this today. I know I learned a lot and it was for me very engaging and interesting. And um, for people that we weren't able to answer your questions, Nicole and I will compile them. Um, she's also, and we will send out answers to the questions later. There were just so many and I wanted to make sure we had some sort of structure and didn't jump around too much. Um, and the webinar will be posted on stopoverdose.org. A link to that will go out to anyone who registered um, along with the other information. So um, once again, just thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and effort and knowledge and just thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Thank y'all. Thank, thank you. you. All right, Nicole, you can